What's up, everybody? This is Steve from Bloom Audio. Today we have the latest in Astell & Kern's AN Futura series, the SE300. While Astell & Kern uses their A and Ultima series DAPs like the SP2000 and SP3000 as sort of the ultimate in sonic refinement where everything is you know, perfectly put together, the AN Futura series is more experimental. They're testing ideas to see how people react or see what they can do with different technology. In this case, SE300 is the first Astle and Kern DAP to use an R2R DAC and also the first one with Class A amplification. With this A in Futura line, sometimes Astle and Kern delivers something of near flagship quality that just happens to have an experimental feature in it, like the SE200. Other times, like the SE180, it ends up coming a little short of your expectations. So is SE300 going to reach for greatness here or should they have taken this one back to the drawing board? Let's take a closer look. Some of the curves and the general construction, the volume knob, uh, even the screen are closer to the SP3000 but there's still some hints of that previous SE series design in there. Compared with the SP3000, SE300 is a little bit lighter, potentially a little bit more pocket friendly, uh, but also like the SP3000, the buttons are pretty touchy, which means you're gonna need to be careful how you put it in there if you don't wanna accidentally skip and pause and that sort of thing. In terms of specs, SE300 has a 5.46 inch 1080 by 1020 touchscreen. The CPU is a quad core and the DAC is fully discrete R2R. For outputs, you have the 3.5 millimeter unbalanced and then a 2.5 millimeter and 4.4 millimeter balanced outputs. These are all switchable between headphone and line out. The 3.5 millimeter output does two VRMS in normal gain mode and three VRMS in high gain mode. For the balanced outputs, 2.5 and 4.4, you get four VRMS in normal gain and six in high gain mode. SE300 supports Bluetooth 5.0 uh, with the standard set of codecs, including AAC, aptX HD, and LDAC. Weight comes in at about 11 ounces and it has 256 gigabytes of built-in memory and supports micro SD cards up to one terabyte. The battery is a 5,050 MHA, 3.8 volt lithium polymer battery, and the total playback time is estimated at about 12 hours. And we didn't quote every last spec on there, but if you look at some of the more technical end of things, this noise floor is bottomless, the background is pitch black, and it sounds great with even the most sensitive, super low impedance IEMs. We couldn't even get a whisper out of this thing with like a campfire Andromeda. Most over-ear headphones will sound great as well. This is actually a little bit more juice than the SP3000 in our testing. So outside of those really hard to drive planar magnetic headphones, you've got plenty of power in here for the full range of you know most dynamic headphones, even high impedance ones like the HD800, and for a pretty good range of easier to moderately hard to drive, planar, I like Meze headphones, and a lot of Hi-Fi Man's newer headphones. Now to get the most out of SE300, you are gonna have to learn the ins and outs of the interface. SE300 uses the same updated OS as SP3000 and has much improved performance over previous Astle and Kern DAPs, found it came up just shy of the SP3000 level performance, uh, but overall, very snappy, fast, responsive operation. Now on the home screen for SE300, you're met with your albums that you can browse through. It shows the cover art with a sort of imaginary CD look to it. You tap the drawer icon in the top right, that gives you a bunch more options for browsing songs, albums, browsing by artist, uh, looking at even specific genres if those are tagged correctly, and playlists. 
And then you can also manually browse in case there's something not properly categorized in your collection and you have the opportunity to favorite items and there are a few other options on here. Now on the top left, you get like a hamburger menu. Here you get access to a number of other features on the device like the file drop feature, AK Connect, as well as important settings for your amp and DAC and a bunch of other stuff. What the most important piece here is probably the services, uh, which you can also quick access the button on the bottom of the screen. From the services menu, uh, you can download a selection of approved apps and then open them once they've been downloaded and installed. So we have Kobuz on this device right now for high res streaming. And you can see the performance is pretty solid. It's not blazing fast, uh, but it does quite well, especially if you had used uh, any of Astel and Kern's dApps from a couple generations ago. This is a massive improvement over that. Now, if you swipe down from the top, you get a whole bunch of settings up here from configuring the Wi Fi to Bluetooth headphones. And if you look, there's this NOS, and if you tap on that, OS, which switches between your DAC modes. You hold down on that, you don't actually get any more functionality here. Oversampling mode uses additional filters to try to basically enhance the timing of the output and almost fine detail that would be missing without that additional processing happening. So back to the top, you can also see with the amp, you can switch between class A operation and class A B operation. And if you hold that down, you'll also be able to check the gain and switch between normal and high gain, as well as between class A and class A B. Of course, Astle and Kern cares about your hearing. So when you switch to high gain, it resets the volume if it was above a certain level. There's also an EQ feature. As soon as you activate the equalizer, it actually does like a 10 dB volume cut, basically to prevent you from, you know, if you have a huge boost in the bass from potentially doing damage there or creating something that doesn't work. Now, you're unable to edit the normal built-in EQ, but you can add your own custom EQ. Now the advanced EQ is kind of like a parametric EQ, but not exactly because it still gives you the filter for each frequency range. So you'll need to manually edit each frequency range while a typical parametric EQ, you would only have maybe four or five total filters that you use across where in this one, uh, you'll have to create a number of filters to really dial that in correctly doesn't quite have all of the freedom and options of like a professional parametric EQ. Now there are a few other options here. It's also worth mentioning the line out, which is a fairly common feature on Astle and Kern's DAPs. So that just fixes your volume either to four volts for the 4.4, 2.5 output or two volts for the 3.5. And what it does is by checking that, that option, you are not actually enabling line out, you're enabling the line out button on the volume control. Go into settings. You can again, see most of what's on here, as well as a few other settings, things like your collection scan, volume limiter, uh, you know, options like double tap to screen to wake, which is a big one. And I wanna also add, you go into system reset, that's how you manually initialize a media scan, kind of have that option hidden in there. So there's a lot in there to play around with. And there are certain options that are going to be exactly what some people need, but other people aren't going to touch them. Things like the file drop or the AK connect, for example. But overall, this is definitely a player where in order to get the most out of it, you're going to need to play around a little bit and experiment with settings to find what works for you. And that's what we're gonna talk about in the sound. To me, the quintessential Astle and Kern sound is just slightly smooth in the highs, 
just slightly warm in the low mids into the bass, just on the romantic side of reference, where it's giving you all the detail and it feels incredibly accurate, but you like the details just a little bit more than you would like them if it was actually 100% accurate. While well, SE300 can deliver a pretty good range of sounds, and some of those settings will get you closer to that you know, classic Astell and Kern tuning, I find it's at its best when it's set at something a little bit more incisive than your typical A and K sound. As a starting point, we'll use the Class AB amp with the NOS setting, so the non-oversampling, uh, the Class AB amp, and I think that gets you closest to the classic Astell and Kern sound. There's just a little bit of warmth. Um, the highs are clear, but a little bit smooth still. And again, this is a sound a lot of people love, but I feel like on SE300, especially listening side by side with SE300, and we'll talk about in a minute the DX320 from Ibasso, doesn't quite feel like you're getting everything you can out of this player with the Class AB amp and the non-oversampling DAC set. Feels like there's just a little bit more in there. And so then if you go ahead and turn on that Class A amp, now this may impact your battery life a little bit, but it's worth it because it really just, you've heard the term, you know, that opens it up. Class A amp really opens up the sound here. You feel like it's bigger, it's wider. There's a better sense of separation in the image. Everything just seems cleaner and crisper. You do lose a little bit of that warmth, but what you gain from it is again, that accuracy, the detail, the spaciousness, and, and that separation in the image. With over-ear headphones, I really felt the Class A was a must because there's always that little bit of sense you get when you switch from a desktop to a portable unit. It's like, oh, like, this sounds good, but I can kind of tell I'm listening on a DAP or portable DAC. And switching to Class A kind of clears that up and gets you closer to that feeling of a powerful desktop amp. Now with Class AB and the oversampling DAC, the OS DAC mode, you do retain more of that warmth, um, but extend that little bit of stronger definition and separation and just a little bit more of a crisp resolution to the sound. I think it does kind of speed up aspects of the decay and add a sharpness to the attack. So with the AB and the NOS, that's again, that's gonna be your, your smoothest setting, but also your least detail. Uh, the Class A, and I'm, right now we're still kinda of talking about the NOS here with the, the Class A, that tends to add that bit of spaciousness to the sound versus the AB, while the oversampling just adds that heightened attack, that more resolving feeling, faster output, and it adds just a little bit more of a clean separation in the image. So when you combine the Class A amp output with the oversampling DAC, you get something that's really crisp, clean, uh, feels super transparent and accurate, uh, and it's just a touch incisive. This almost reminds me a little bit of a, like a chord sound, not exactly chord, but closer to that, um, a little bit closer to some of the Ibasso daps, which have more of a reference type delivery, but it's a really incredible execution of this with that oversampling and the Class A amp. Again, it might be a little bright for some. I find it especially good if you pair with headphones or IEMs that are a tiny bit warm, maybe a little bit muddy at points. It helps clean that up and kind of give you the best of both worlds. But then again, if you want that highly revealing experience, you want to squeeze every last drop of detail out of your high resolution tracks, you know, again, that class A oversampling setting, you know, put on your most revealing headphones, get your HD 800, whatever else, and you're gonna get a really incredible experience with this. Of course, we've mentioned the SP3000 a little bit. 
But to get a better context on the sound, we wanted to bring in the DX320 from my basso. We've done the, this dance a few times on our channel, so if you've watched a few of our DAP reviews, we almost always bring out an Ashton Kern and an Ibasso, and we, we make them fight. And we say a lot of the same things. So I'm gonna get this part over a little bit more quickly this time. Better build, SE300. Better app support, DX320. Better library management. SE300. Better for sensitive IEMs? SE300. Better overall interface? DX320. And over your headphones? Tie. And the rest of this comparison will need a little bit more detail. In terms of customization options, SE300 is going to give you more out of the box. Just those basically two settings, the amp setting and the DAC setting give you a wider range than the DAC filters that are available on the DX320, you know, just in the UI out of the box, kind of being the only option there. However, the DX320 has amp cards, which you can purchase and swap in. You can switch them out for different headphones, different uses. They've got the new tube ones and that whole deal. So that gives the edge over to the DX320 overall, but you're getting more out of the SE300 without having to, you know, get out a fancy screwdriver, turn it off, swap it out, turn it back on again, and more out of the DX320 overall. So that kind of ends up being a tie depending on exactly what you're looking for. Do you want more options or do you just want more options out of the box without having to tinker it? All? In terms of overall sonic performance, I would give SE300 the edge. While the class A and oversampling output is, you know, again, slightly brighter than the DX320. Uh, listening side by side, the presentation of the sound stage, the three dimensionality, the imaging, all of that is stronger. And that sense of speed and resolution is also stronger on the SE300. Now where the DX320 might have the edge here is just in the tuning. The, you know, out of the box standard amp card isn't the strongest version of the DX320. I think especially if you use the AMP14 card, the DX320 pulls ahead in that sort of musicality department, where the AMP14, I think, adds some improvements to that, the sound stage and imaging. And it, for me, I do prefer a slightly warmer sound. So I prefer that little warmth, a little bit of extra bass in the DX320, little smoothness in the highs that you're getting with DX320 plus AMP14 as a matter of, of personal preference, but as a matter of technical performance, SE300 is definitely the winner. Part of this comes down to, you know, how much work do you wanna to have to do to get the sound? With the DX320 and the AMP14 card, and that's just incredible sonic performance combined with great musicality. You know, considering the total package is still kind of around the $2,000 range. If you take the SE300, right out of the box, turn everything up and you've got this great, crisp, clear, more technical output out of that. So again, that's gonna come down to exactly what you're looking for. If I say slightly warm and you kinda uh, warm, uh, then SE300 is where you wanna go. If I say slightly bright, and again, you go, ah, my ears, then DX320 probably remains the option you'll wanna look at in that under $2,000 range for a DAP. So with SE300, you get that classic Astel and Kern build quality. You get the improvements to the UI and performance that they've been rolling out with this generation of players. And you get some stuff like the R2R DAC and the Class A amp that they've never done before. And with that, you also get the ability to come really close to flagship level performance in the sound. In short, SE300 is a great player and exactly what we're hoping for in Astle and Kern's A and Future Align. Thanks for watching. You can check out SE300 and a lot of other great products at bloomaudio.com. Be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll be back soon with more high fidelity audio content.